11th of March 2021. Today we're going to talk about a simple definition of life, or we will simply define life, move on to discuss consciousness as a continuum, and map that to levels of moral imposition. So first off, we have to define what life is before we discuss consciousness, because as we understand consciousness, only living things or only life forms have consciousness. Life can be defined as a locally anti-entropic phenomenon that, I guess I have to define entropy first there. Uh, entropy is, I guess we could say, the tendency towards maximal disorder. If I mix hot and cold water together, it costs more energy that's inherent in the whole cup of water to pick out, you know, to, to unmix them. Unmixing things, there's a lot of things that become unmixable, demixable. We don't, you can't sort things back out once they've been combined. So one effect of that is that we survive off of the sun's energy, whether it's through fossil fuels that have stored that energy, or it's through foods that we've grown using that, or it's, you know, through solar rays or whatever. Generally speaking, most of the energy that we use comes off the sun. But as the sun creates energy, as it generates energy, it is destroying its nuclear fuel as it goes, and eventually they don't have any more. And then the, the sun either, you know, supernovas or black holes or collapses or whatever. But the, the point being that the amount of energy is not infinite. Sorting costs energy. Identification costs energy. Categorization costs energy. All these things have energy costs. As fuels are burned, remnants are left, and eventually you don't have anything else useful. You, you kind of exhaust the amount of useful work that can be done. In addition, the, the universe is spreading out, and that eventually results in a uh, kind of a, a heat death situation where there is no more useful work that can occur. So life can be defined in this context as a unique phenomena that has occurred in the universe that uses energy to create and maintain local order. But in using energy, the cost of maintaining local order is an increased rate of disorder surrounding it in the external environment. So locally anti-entropic phenomena, that's one way to define life. It's a process. It's not, not a thing. It's a process. So some life forms can become conscious. We would say that bacteria is not a conscious thing. A bacterial colony may have some way of remembering things. There may be some memory there, but it's not really conscious. We move on up to animals. We would say that a fish is maybe less conscious than a dog. A primate is more conscious than a dog is. A human is more conscious than a primate. Well, we are primates, but humans being sort of the, the apex of that. Then we go, we stack that up and we say, well, a, a human family is conscious, less conscious than an individual is. It's conscious as far as all members of a family know each other in enough detail that they can uh, predict each other's needs and act together without coordination. If we get to a tribe size, well, that starts to break down a little bit more. Large tribes, it's not possible to know what's going on with everybody, so you can't anticipate everyone's actions or needs without prior coordination. And once we get to the size of a village or a city, it's really kind of gone already. The idea that they're there's some unified consciousness. There may be unified signals. There are cultural signals, in-group cues within that locality. That that type of messaging still exists, but you're you're back to that the level of consciousness that you're exhibiting at that point is once again reduced to sort of that of a bacterial colony. When you look at a nation, that's absolutely true. A nation will have in-group cues that are very broad, but a lot of you know inside knowledge across the group will be lost. A lot of nuance may be lost once you get to a national sized entity. And once you get outside of that, once you're beyond that to like, you know, humanity, there's nothing there's nothing there. So you have a spectrum. You start out with uh, bacteria, say unconscious colonies, unconscious, getting into animals that have their own agency, semi conscious. You increase consciousness until you reach the individual. And then as you aggregate humans, the more humans you put in a single group, consciousness is reduced again. Now this maps to moral behavior in the sense that humans, I shouldn't say humans, I should just say living entities are only able to understand and comprehend their situation if they are conscious. Heightened consciousness correlates with higher moral responsibility. We expect zero moral behavior out of bacteria. We expect zero moral behavior out of uh, a fungal colony or a bacterial colony. We don't expect very moral behavior out of fish. Uh, we expect much more moral behavior from a dog, though, a pet dog in particular. We expect a bit of moral behavior from bears and animals that have to really tend for their young. We absolutely, the, the definition of moral authority and moral imposition occurs when we reach humans. A problem that we have right now 
in understanding what's going on in geopolitics uh, is that we extend the moral imposition on individuals. We try to project the same moral impositions on large groups, but we do it selectively because we're not really honest about how we do that. So we'll say, well, the United States government is, uh, they're, they're, it's immoral. Well, it's, that's not true. It can't be immoral. By definition, it cannot be immoral if a large group structure like a government is not even conscious. We cannot ever expect moral behavior from a, a structure such as that. So the government is not a moral entity. It is an amoral entity that is inhabited by what we hope are moral individuals. So there's a distinction here that has to be made between the aggregate entity that is a government or a nation or a city or whatever, a comp even a large company, and our ability to project or impose moral standards on that group or, or on, that, on that collective structure. So collectives are amoral in nature. They're not moral. They're not immoral. They are amoral. They, they, the concept of morality doesn't really apply when you get to a very, very large organization. Not everybody in the organization can even know what the organization's up to because they're, they're too big. Moral imposition is used, more, really kind of moral projection is used as a political tool to trick people into moral arguments that are nonsensical. This is a very dangerous trend and it's been going on for ages. To understand discussions about geopolitics, we have to understand that there's a duality. There's the amoral collective, the amoral government, the amoral nation, the, the amoral army, every, you know, the amoral company. All these structures are amoral. Within those, though, there are individuals and we do hold them to account for their moral or immoral behavior. So we can't say that the office of the president is a moral office. It's not. It's an amoral office. But we can say the president himself is an immoral or moral person. So these are two very distinct judgments that have to be made. And without making them, if you if you avoid making these this distinction, you are always in a mess of weird gotchas and, and you know, it, it, it becomes ridiculous very quickly, the, the type of arguments people start posing, because doing cheetah flips in their head to try to justify why one moral looking action is okay or not okay where an immoral or moral action is okay or not okay. On the other hand, you know, this is a really, really silly thing. It's a bad road to go down. Keep this in mind whenever evaluating political arguments. So, again, to sum up, the greater an entity's consciousness, the greater moral responsibility applies to it. The less consciousness that an entity has, the less moral responsibility applies to it. That means that we do not judge plants and animals and things in a very strongly moral way. We do judge individuals in a strongly moral way. We judge families and small communities somewhat morally, and we have to abandon the concept of moral responsibilities uh, when we reach the scale of large organizations or countries or nations or cities or whatever. Those large collectives are amoral by definition. It is important to understand, however, that they are inhabited by individuals who retain their moral responsibility. So, individuals, moral. Large organizations, amoral. Keep that in mind. I'm going to be putting this on YouTube and Rumble and maybe BitChute, maybe on Locals, I don't know. Anyway, if you're, I don't know how long this is going to exist on YouTube, so that's still an issue that we've got. So anyway, that's a wrap. I will catch you in the next one.